speakers. The first are from Waste Formal Recyclers, Brandon and Jim. Brandon is a class of 2005 Westchester alum, a history major, correct? Correct, yes. Correct, right. So uh, you do not have to obviously be a business major to be an entrepreneur. And it's great to see him reaching back to the university to help hopefully motivate and inspire some of you. Uh, we have another program at 2 o'clock uh, from a school representative talking about the mobile plus um, social equation. I encourage you to stay for the questions between events and enjoy the second one as well. So without any further ado, I will turn it over and run in the seat. For Jim, sorry. It's okay.
University of Kansas in 1999 with a Bachelor in Anthropology. So another major that doesn't necessarily uh, lend itself to career advancement unless you're going to go into teaching or, or you know, other, other, other fields, get a PhD, whatnot. Um, I came out to uh, Pennsylvania in 2002. Um, my, uh, Girlfriend at the time was studying at Long Gardens. I just came out here to see what the East Coast was like. Um, while I was out here, I ended up having a variety of jobs, one of which was um, installing solar panels when the solar market was still uh, happening. And, and I was in environmental business and always cared about environmental issues. I was very happy to be doing that kind of work. Um, but in doing that work and driving all over Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, and New Jersey, we were burning a lot of fuel. And I thought we could be an even more environmentally friendly business if we could, you know, burn less fuel or be more environmentally conscious and, and how you know, how we got around. Um, and that's what led me to purchase a 1983 Mercedes Benz for $1,100, driving back uh, to uh, to Westchester area and convert it to run on used cooking oil. So it was a hobby project that I was trying to show uh, my bosses at the time, the people I was working for at the time. Um, you know, an alternative is trying to prove the technology to them so that they might adopt that in their in their business. Um, right around that time is when the, um, uh, the grant funding and the, the subsidies for the solar industry all disappeared, and I got laid off as a result. And I, all I had at the time was a grease car and some minor capability to pick up grease to put it in my car. Um, so. Um, not having a job and having that, seeing that there might be some potential for me need to be able to make some money on the side and not get a real job at the time, I, you know, started to form more of a, a, a business around that and get more clients than I maybe necessarily needed to keep my own car going. Um, and it, it, it started to actually turn into a business. Um, at that point, it became too much for me to do. I couldn't collect oil, I couldn't sell the clients, I couldn't build a business plan, I couldn't. I couldn't do all of that together, and, and luckily enough, Brendan just came along and said, hey man, I'll, I think what you're doing sounds really cool, and I want to get in on it. And, uh, you know, from that point on, it really it made, it made the business capable of even growing into a business. It was really just a hobby at that point. Um, and there was a lot of luck involved for me. Um, I, the first time I actually met Jim and realized what he was doing, I just happened to walk home from the jewelry store down a certain alleyway where he was with one of my friends having a beer on the porch. He was dressed up in a suit. Um, I think it was just a green shirt. I only had a green shirt. He had a pair of pants and a green shirt. He was yeah. dressed up. <laughs> he was not looking as normal. So I'll go that way. So I asked him, you know, why, uh, why, why he dressed up? And, he, and that's how he kind of gave him the spiel of what he was trying to do. And I thought it was great. So that was 2006. 2006, late, late 2005, 2006. Um, you know, at, at that point, um, you know, like I said, it's, it, you know, neither of us had any business background, neither of us had any um, um, real idea of what we were doing. Um, and we knew that. So one of the things that my mom recommended to me was uh, she's an insurance agent and she insures a, a group called SCORE in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And uh, SCORE is um, a nonprofit that has uh, Tom Thomas back right there. He was our SCORE advisor. Um, people who were in the business world their entire life donate their time to help people who have no idea what they're doing potentially uh, in business. And Tom kind of brought us in and uh, guided us and helped us you know, figure out what we needed to do, you know, the whole you know, learning. A, uh, how to read a profit and loss, or you know what we should be looking at, uh, and the financials, and, and making us go out and do homework and bring it back to them. And, uh, that really helped us mature significantly. Um, and, and there's a variety of organizations like SCORE. You know, at the same time we were working with the Chester County Economic Development Council, which is another uh, potentially free service that helps you build a business plan, helps you figure out some of the some of the ins and outs of, of starting a new business. Um, and there's a, a, a wide range of different services available if you just go out and look for them. But, you know, the, the Economic Development Council and, and SCORE, I mean, uh, we didn't have a business plan until we talked to those people. And we didn't even know what a business plan was. We had a great idea. We, we, 
we had, I think, business minds. You know, we could, you know, balance our checkbook. You know, some people can't do that. Um, and we saw the, the, the value of the product and knew that we could, you know, collect it for this and sell it for more. And that, that was a good thing and it would be um, something that would work. But in terms of putting all that on paper and, you know, structuring the, 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 whole, the whole thing, um, having people that had been there before it was really, really helpful. Do, do you guys, you, I guess you don't know what we do either necessarily. We didn't really describe what we sell recyclers that is. So briefly, you know, we collect oil. Yeah, we collect oil from places like Sykes and Lawrence Center and um, Tech up in town. Jitters? Jitters, yeah. Jitters was one of our, Jitters was our original meeting, uh, meeting grounds actually. A lot of work got done there. Um, Taco Tuesdays, you know, 21 was worth it. Um, so we did. We take that. We process that cooking oil um, into a product that is easily made in the biodiesel, and we sell to uh, a biodiesel refinery. A majority of the product that we produce is sold to uh, Hero VX, which is a biodiesel refinery in Erie. So we actually fill rail cars up with cooking oil, ship it up to Erie. It gets made into biodiesel and it's distributed uh, mostly in Pennsylvania. So it's exactly right. It's we guarantee that everything is domestically produced and domestically used. So previous to uh, collection businesses like us, there were rendering companies that would come in and they would take that cooking oil along with animal carcasses and fats and they would render that into um, animal food, dog food, or cosmetics, some paint materials, really, really kind of nasty stuff. Um, you know, animal carcasses and whatnot. Uh, we, we stay away from that and just focus on vegetable oil. So we came into a marketplace they had um, renders that had been in business for 150 years, very entrenched businesses, very established businesses already, you know, uh, handling this product, this commodity. And it was only recently where biofuels started to take off and have a, a market uh, of, of its own. And, um, you know, um, we were able to move into that marketplace because we saw the value of keeping the vegetable oil separate from all those other rendered materials that there'd be much higher resale value for that vegetable oil if we handled it that way, and that we stayed away from rendering other things and just dealt with the vegetable oil. Um, you know, it's something that bigger companies couldn't do at the time and didn't recognize the value of. They'd been doing the same thing for 150 years. They weren't going to change anything. They were profitable. They had all their technology. They had everything figured out. Being small at the time and seeing that opportunity, we were able to move in and um, establish ourselves in a relatively new market. When we started that business, um, when we started doing this business, it was something that people typically paid money for. So, um, PF Chains, for example, was paying you know five, six thousand dollars a year to have the oil removed. Um, we came in and we were charging 150 bucks for the year. for the year, which we tried to get in free service when we started because that, that was the whole model. It's going to be a free service, you know. Uh, we really didn't we didn't uh, need pay people, but people didn't believe the service could be legitimate if it was free. So we had to charge 150 dollars. To convince them that it was legitimate, which is hilarious, really. So, you know, PF Chains, no, no, we don't want anything to do with it. I came back two months later and was like, yeah, we'll give you 150, uh, we'll, we'll charge you 150 bucks. Oh, oh, all of a sudden you're legitimate. We'll, we'll use your service. Uh, yeah, this, if you go to the. This <coughs> Slowly progressed. We, um, we we have a what was the name of the fire company? West Bradford, the van. Oh yeah, West Bradford. So we purchased a used van from the West Bradford Fire Company, fitted it with a uh, 250 gallon tote and trash pump. Uh, it didn't work that well. And uh, I went out and got restaurants, and Jim went out and collected the oil basically. And he would you know go out. <clears throat> Five times a day, four times a day, um, drive back to the cotton. Where were we then? Yeah, we, we started in my backyard. I lived on a farm out near Coatesville, um, in Coatesville. And then we went from the farm to this guy's greenhouse. We went from this guy's greenhouse to, uh, we used to have another partner, went to his backyard. And then from there, we were able to move into the warehouse area that we are right now. But it was very much, um, I think what Brent, Brent was trying to say, it was very, um, very small and, and it was kind of slapdash, and we threw it together, and we were always moving around and shuffling our stuff all over the place because we couldn't afford rent. We didn't, you know, have, um, you know, a loan to 
work off of or any resource because it's just that credit card. And you know, at one point Jim was driving down to Philly three times in one day. So driving down to Philly from about 30 minutes west of here three times. So down, back, down, back, traffic, everything else. So there was a lot of, of a lot of people would have given up at that point, in my opinion. And uh, I'm happy I didn't have to you know, do the driving. <laughs> So we eventually uh, found a property in Molina, Pennsylvania. We're there. Right outside of Coastal. Right outside of South Coastal. And uh, we set up a shop there. We were lucky enough that someone would even rent to us. We, we, we could pay rent now, but um, no one wanted to rent to us because of the nature of our business. It's, you know, it's a mess. No one wanted to see a mess on their property. So while we um, moved into Molina, we set up the shop. Uh, we started, you know, growing our customer base pretty significantly. Um, it was kind of a, a map of of Westchester, which was what basically, you know, the beginning for us because it was easy access. And I was a student here, and I went out and talked to the restaurant owners a lot, and we were able to kind of get a majority of the restaurants in Westchester. Um, we actually developed our own software right around this time. Yeah, when we moved into the warehouse, you know, as, as you know, 2007, 2008, the market started to climb significantly. You know, the price of grease was going through the roof, which was great for us. Um, you know, we were starting to get to the point where we could invest in, in technology that was going to help, help help us do more with less. So we were able to buy our first um, septic truck at that time. So we collect all of our oil in septic cell trucks, big vacuum trucks. So we pull up to the parallel container suck it out. And there's probably some pictures on the slideshow that we'll, we'll bring up just to show some pictures later. But um, by being able to get that truck that had a you know 1600 gallon capacity versus a 250 gallon capacity, by being able to get that small warehouse space and, and establish ourselves that way, I wasn't driving to Philly three, four times a day. I was driving to Philly once. And then a lot of other stuff could be done in the meantime. Um, we, there was a point when Brennan first, several times through Brennan's sales efforts where he would pack on so many sales so quickly that I'd just freak out. Like, you gotta stop. You know, this is before we were really getting paid either. You know, so we weren't getting paid. We we're, you know, paying for the equipment, the, the, the fuel, but we weren't taking a salary. Um, but yeah, we had to we had to put him on hold a bunch because he would just go out get ten new accounts. It's like, geez, well, how am I gonna afford ten barrels? You know, twenty dollar barrels. I don't have two hundred dollars to go get the barrels and put it at the location. You gotta take a break. Um, but once we got that truck, once we got that space, once we had that extra time, you know, he had free reign to do whatever he wanted. He could just go take over the world. Because that wasn't, you know, the logistics were there to, to be able to actually do the business. And that kind of brings us to, uh, I think, Westchester University <coughs> at that point. Um, our first real big break, I guess you can say, um, Aramark here. Uh, there was a dining service director by the name of Gary Flad gave us a shot um, to collect the cooking oil here. That was a great idea. So we were, this was the first Aramark account for us, actually, with Westchester University. And it kind of uh, snowballed from there. And eventually, funny enough, uh, we got Lincoln Financial Field next. A couple of universities, other universities, Immaculata, I think. And then it came to Lincoln Financial Field, which was our first big Aramark account. And uh, Jim and I were in Chicago a couple months ago. And we met with the, he works for another company now, it's like Levy Restaurants. It's like the Aramark of the Midwest. And uh, <clears throat> he met with us, uh, made a couple of beers, and he told me that the honest to God truth why he gave us a shot at Lincoln Financial Field was because he was a Westchester alum and I was as well. So that kind of Westchester helped us out again uh, because the guy in charge of Lincoln Financial Field happened to come here and you know, thought <laughs> basically that we shouldn't be collecting the grease there because he thinks we were too rinky dink, but he'll give us a shot because I went to Westchester. And he flat out said that to us, which I didn't know until a couple months ago. So we started getting these larger accounts, getting in with all the universities, getting in with the uh, Citizens Bank Bar for the Wells Fargo Center, and then you know, eventually we had on you know, 50, 60 accounts a month, um, kind of leading us. And, and sorry to cut in, but you know, to give some perspective on what you know, Aramark means to us, and, you know, they're a very huge company. They have multiple locations all over the, the you know world. Um, you know, it went from us getting somewhere like Jitters that produces maybe 30 gallons of grease a month 
to you know Lincoln Financial Field, which every time there's a game we get 600,000 gallons of grease. So it's you know in, in multiple locations like that. That used to be actually in, in Lincoln Financial Field. Just to give them a little more credit, they've actually started the, how green they are with the solar panels and everything else. They even take that to the next level with the cooking oil. So they actually bring in a company that filters out their cooking oil now, so they get an extra game out of it or something. So they're not being you know, I mean, it, it, the oil is perfectly fine to still try it, but they really are, you know, walking the walk when it comes to trying to be sustainable as a, as a team. But, but people giving us those chances and that, that, that relationship, you know, uh, not only the, the Westchester alum relationship, but, but being able to talk to someone and really believe in what you're pitching, and that's something that Brennan has a tremendous skill with. I mean, he, he, he reads people very well. He likes to talk to people. Not, he, not in this form. I'm not good at this. <laughs> he can sell you well, that, He's very good at um, uh, being very genuine and, and describing um, the service in a way that, that really relates to whoever he's trying to sell it to. Uh, and when you, at least in our experience, if you pitch yourself and you're honest about it and you do believe in what you're trying to sell, uh, you're, you know, people, people see that. You know, they, they see that you're not just trying to swindle them and you get a chance, like Aaron Mark, that turns in, and that you do well with that. <laughs> And they're like, oh wow, you know, I'm happy I give this guy a chance. We can give him another chance, another chance, another chance. Um, and that's so, you know, Brendan, in terms of pitching the service and being genuine and, and explaining it well to people, is the one half, and then the other half is providing that quality service and following up with his promises. So many times, Brendan would tell me, hey man, we got to really step it up right here. You know, there's, you know, these people are really going out on a limb for us. And I, on the other hand, do that and you know, just perpetuate the whole. Thing. Sorry. Um, so here we are today. I guess we're, we're is the uh, business and uh, society class here? No, they're not. Oh, so that one is the show. That one is the wait. That's going to sound a lot more. Are they coming or not? At nine. Prior to that. Okay. No problem. So you can kind of get an idea of where we are today. All these pins represent a, a client. We have over uh, 3,500 clients at this point. I think before I did. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, you know, we went from nothing to you know over 3,500 accounts. We're picking up 1.8 million gallons of oil a year. Um, we have 31 employees. Um, you know, it's it's turned into it's turned into a real business, and and it's not just something. You know, Brendan was alluding to the, the garden project. We don't just collect grease. You know, one of the things, one of the things Brendan always said at the beginning, it wasn't about just selling the service. It was about providing solutions, being a solution provider to our clients. You know, um, they needed someone to pick up their recycling, you know, their their plastic recycling, and find that person for them. They wanted to know where they could get better vegetables, and find that person. So he was always working, working those relationships. And always looking at other other avenues um, to, to make the sale, other avenues to make the business grow, and, and as a result, you know we've developed our own software package that we're selling to people now. We have a software company. Um, so there's the garden project. Um, you see have, how handsome it used to be. We have we have a, a, a property holding company where we have tenants now. And we're building, uh, and we have built a green industrial park that houses other like-minded businesses. And we try and act as a business incubator for businesses. You know, they're starting out like we were. Give other people that same opportunity to, you know, get off the ground. And basically, the building that I said we moved into when people didn't want to rent to us, we have now. We purchased that property, and um, there's a company called Organic Mechanics, um, who's not a Westchester alum, but he lives in Westchester named Mark Highland. And uh, he does organic, peat free potting soil, and they take up the majority of our warehouse space at this point. So, they, like Jim said, we were kind of an incubator for a lot of other small businesses. They started very similarly to us, and they started right alongside us. We knew that when we started, they were starting their business, and they got to a point where they needed warehouse space, so it was a real, really nice fit that way. So this is our shop now. Uh, well, this is our shop in the early years. Now there's no room at all in that. Uh, it's filled with tanks. Filled with tanks. And then we bought the adjacent property to the one we just discussed about uh, Mark Highland and the organic mechanics, and it was kind of uh, not kind of, it was definitely dilapidated, um, not touched for, for years and years and years. Uh, the, the, you know, the doors were mounds of, of dirt rather than fix a door. The guy just piled dirt in front of it to stop people from getting in. So we took that over and 
we started uh, uh, revitalizing the property, and, and that's when we really actually started to grow a lot more employees. This is our service garage and, and the office for the service manager and the dispatch manager. Yeah, there you go. We're slept right now. And what you see on the front of there is the stage. So over the course of several years, you know, every year we built a little bit more of the stage. Brendan plays music, a lot of other people in our organization play music. Um, it's natural for us to want to have a stage. Um, but these are the things that aren't maybe necessarily you know, part of the business plan, um, but breed um, you know, uh, creativity and, and give, give the employees something to, to really appreciate. Um, we uh, eat a lot of lunch on, on the stage and use it for a lot of different events and a lot of different, has a lot of different benefits. System rings these night. Last winter was there. Very good. So, when you have your own business, you're going to have a lot of moments that you feel like it's time to give up and we can't do this, it's impossible. And we kind of you know, put our nose to the grindstone. And uh, we actually had a flood this year, too, which destroyed our property. Uh, and we were able to you know, bounce back because you know, the people we work with are uh, really just excellent employees and uh, we're lucky. Some of our clients, Geno's. Yeah. Oh, so here's the Mo Green Garden project. Yeah, so we, um, <laughs> organic mechanics located with us, co located with us. We shared some office space early on, um, and they needed to do seed trials, plant trials with their materials, so they started throwing their body soil all around the property, um, growing the plants, taking pictures for their, their marketing materials. Um, we all like food, so we, we participated and helped in, in their gardening so that we could all get produce out of that. We, none of us had a garden in our backyard or our backyard, so we made a garden around the office. And every year that was something that just, you know, snowballed and, and grew because people were into it. it. People liked the fact that they could come to work and there was a beautiful garden and they could pick some lettuce on the way out the door. Um, and we started to get more and more participation from businesses on site and people that, that work there, as well as people from outside the community that would come in just to help. We started having a garden night every Tuesday or Wednesday night, depending on the season. And um, you know, the gardens have grown to um, you know many times the size that that initial bed. There's every inch of ground that we have is covered by gardens at this point. We did over 2,600 pounds of uh, organic produce. Uh, this year, it was donated to the Chester County Food Bank. Um, we're working more closely with um, nonprofits and charitable organizations now to donate a lot of that produce. And up until this year, um, it was done completely on a volunteer basis. There was no full-time employee. There was no. There was no any. No one got paid to do anything. It was just people that would show up and do this gardening. This year, we hired um, uh, a 19-year-old guy, uh, Will Colvin, uh, to be the, the garden guy. But um, you know, it, it just shows that you know. Um, you know, Brendan came on for free, worked pro bono. The community came on for free to make the food. Um, you know, I think if you have, if you really believe in what you're doing, you have the right idea. You can get people to do a lot, a lot for you just based on that. And to keep that passion going, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we we do things like the garden project and the stage and some of the other things we do. It really does act as a great motivator. That being said, every Tuesday, starting in April, that was bored, uh, it includes free dinner. It starts at five thirty or six. Yeah, five to nine. We have bonfires. It's fun. There's Bill. The glasses. Jim also likes to make these. So that, that's made out of small barrels. So one of the things that we, we do there too is repurpose. I mean, that's a big part of our business, repurposing something that was not didn't have a lot of value into something that maybe has value. So one of the guys that uh, works on site, uh, he has a woodworking business. We just had a couple beers in a bonfire one night and started tearing cans apart. And now we have all these big metal flowers. Uh, I think that several of those are going to pull off the flower show this year alongside organic mechanics and stuff. So you see the uh, garden there. Here's everyone. Some are still with us somewhere. We have extremely low attrition with uh, the clients that we service. We lose almost no accounts to competition. You know, unfortunately, the restaurant industry is what it is, and a lot of places go out of business every year. So we don't lose our we don't lose uh, our clients. We really don't lose our employees either. Uh, there's very few people that have, you know, 
you know, decided to leave um, or, or had to leave for whatever reason um, because they, they get really, uh, they get into what they're doing. They really believe in what they're doing. And we, there isn't a lot of space when we hire people for someone that isn't going to be interested in, in their day to day. If you're, if you, we, we don't want you to work with us unless you're not going to be passionate about what you're doing and really appreciate your day. If it's, if it's only a job to you, you're probably not going to stick around. Uh, one important thing, sorry, we're going like back and forth between garden projects and, and short clip and oil, but the one important thing that we guys mentioned about the garden project and you know, the business and society thing, that's why I was hoping they were, they were here, is the Coastal Youth Initiative. Yeah. So, um, we're going to be able four kids from coastal area school districts. I think the previous year was six, seven, seven. seven. So these kids basically um, donate their time in the summer. It's, it's, it's supposed to be like a uh, preparation. For work, work training and workplace training. training. So that they would work at our facility, tending the garden, um, you know, working on some, some artwork, and some murals uh, for our location. Um, and basically, they learn to you know, how to work a garden and, and, uh, and normal day-to-day -day work skills. Um, they were there in the morning. They left every afternoon. And on Friday, the Coastal Youth Initiative would have a program where the, the students uh, learn how to uh, write a business plan. So they were really prepping themselves to um, enter the business world, or, or you know, basically, I mean, it's a, it's a huge feather in the cap, and they're you know filling out their college. Uh, application. Um, but these kids were great. Um, we had a lot of fun with them. We brought a chef up from some of our restaurants uh, every week or twice a week. So we brought uh, like the chef from Budokan in at Stephen Starr's restaurants came up and he took stuff from the garden, showed the kids how to prep the food, make something with um, the vegetables from the garden. Uh, we had a local farm that donated meat um, and he showed them how to prep and cook meat. Um, we had a lot, of, a lot of Westchester chefs participated as well. Ramshead did, and uh, the High Street Cafe both participated and were very helpful. And I think uh, really the kids really uh, gravitated towards that and had a, had a lot of fun with it. And, and I was just going to say, you know, these things that, that we're talking about now, you know, outside of our outside of our core business, the Garden Project, the Coastal Youth Initiative, these other things, they all have some sort of tie-in, you know, even if it's small. So like the Garden Project. We were spending a lot of money to throw away garbage that came in with the oil. We would pick up the oil, there'd be fryer beds, and meat beds, and chicken bones, and all these weird things would come in with the oil. And that was costly for us to get rid of. So we started composting that on site, and that was at the same time we were starting the garden project. And all the gardens on site are made from garbage, our garbage. So we're picking up someone else's garbage, we're turning it into fuel, and the garbage from that process we're turning into the gardens. So having the gardens actually serves a purpose in helping us get rid of our waste. Um, working with organizations like this and doing good works has a distinct PR value to it. Um, you know, it, we um, were not uh, regulated by the DP in our business and, until recently. Um, DP showed up on our site, uh, you know, six months ago. And said, hey, you know, you, you need all these permits. Didn't anyone ever tell you this? I was like, well, no. You know, I, I didn't know. We tried. We tried to do our due diligence, our research, and we contacted people, and we, we tried to make sure we were doing things right. But um, because we were doing these good works and they saw that we were genuine in what we were trying to do for the environment and, and the community around us, DEP has been very helpful in getting everything compliant and could have been, it could have been a situation where they shut down our business. But instead, they see all this good work that we're doing and they want to help. So, um, you know, the, the Garden Project and some of these other things have this, this big other benefit dealing with regulatory agencies, but also just in terms of uh, convincing our customer base that we're, we're, we're the best business to, to choose and that we're, we're honest about what we're doing. Don't forget the club, um, In conjunction with uh, Victory Brewing Company, also this year we did a, a brand new wine cleanup. Uh, a lot of participants. Victory was great. They were very tune with uh, trying to clean up the uh, brandy wine and, and, and really put a lot of effort and brought out their entire staff. Uh, pretty much anyone who wanted to come out, they gave a half day or a day off to come and clean up the brandy wine place. Parties. We have a, an event every year, Energy Independence Day, and the events and the Art Harvest Party. Um, 
I'll make sure that I let you know what the date is so you can pass it on to everyone. Uh, if you ever want to come up and see the facility, what is energy Independence Day? Every April? Every April, probably every April. So I'll you know, give you the dates. Everyone's welcome to come. We have live music, uh, some food trucks that are out here, uh, potentially will be up there. Um, you know, a few people that we service collect cooking oil from and have food trucks come up. Uh, we have uh, canning. Workshops. Workshops, thank you. A lot of why, we, you know, back to, you know, why we do these things, you know, the, the PR associated with it, you know, the community outreach, you know, we've always truly believed that, you know, a business needs to be um, a good citizen to the community that it belongs to. So when we do things like this, we're in a very, very impoverished area. 25% of people in Modena are below the poverty line. Um, there was no industry there. There were no jobs. It was really beneficial for us when we first moved in because rent was cheap, you know. Um, but since then, we've tried to do the gardens and we've tried to do these different events to not only um, you know, sell our organization in active marketing, but as, as a way to outreach the local community and, and give them an opportunity to, to learn and you know, have jobs in some cases and just uh, see what we're doing. Um, so it has, you know, um, having a party sometimes is the best way to you know, market your business. Yeah. We, uh, we just, um, you know, I, I mentioned that I worked for the solar industry before. Uh, we solar cyclers, and that was a business that was completely based in Pennsylvania. It was completely based on um, subsidy and grant funding. The business couldn't exist otherwise, and when that money disappeared, my job disappeared. So when we got into uh, collecting cooking oil, while there were some government subsidies and grants and things like that, we never had a lot of a lot of faith in that. Nor were we going to base our whole business model on any of that. It was going to be a stable business, and if we could leverage some other funds from some, some other places, we would do that. But we made sure that we were building an energy business, a green business, that was a business rather than something that was wholly dependent on just handouts. Um, and as a result, we've been able to stand the test of time where other like businesses that were maybe more, more based on, on those handouts it, it went away. So that's been a good thing for us. That being said, you know, recently uh, we heard about, through Tom Thomas initially, uh, uh, suggested we, we talk to some uh, local politicians about getting a, a budget for some funding for a rail spur project. Um, we found out about a DOT grant uh, for the construction of a new rail, and uh, we were awarded $270,000 to build a, a rail siding on our property. So there's already a rail nearby, um, and uh, you know, the DOT saw it as a, a good project, and we were able to, uh, so, you know, we just started that project yesterday, really. Um, we had a limited amount of time to put it together. Um, you know, we had a week, four days, four days to put it together because we had no idea that this grant was available. And we actually went to a Westchester business, uh, Walnut Street Labs, uh, out in uh, Walnut Street, and uh, they helped us put together the, uh, the, the package that we presented um, in front of the uh, was the DP it was Penda. Penda. Yeah, in front of Penda, and we were awarded the grant. And you know, one of the one of the main focuses of that package was a lot of the other things we were doing other than just collecting oil. You know, rather than shipping by truck, you know, a tractor trailer six thousand gallons, a rail car is twenty four thousand gallons. Um, uses a fraction of the energy to transport that material. There's a lot less um, logistics and planning and coordinating with the train than with tractor trailers. Great benefits. Can be a really huge increase in efficiency for us as a business. And DOT saw that, but they also saw these other things we were doing and thought that would make it a model project for them to get this money. So by seeing the garden project, by seeing some of these other things, it, it helped us help us get the grant. Questions? You want to talk about energy? Go ahead. Yes, please. So I'm curious. At what point do you outgrow your site and replicate it at another location? It's a good question. With the with the rail siding, um, that's. Decades away. Um, by being able to just bring a rail car on site that has 24,000 gallon capacity, um, that would be, uh, we would just keep bringing rail cars on site. So we have a modular storage. Um, I got you. And uh, yeah, so that, that was definitely a concern. I mean, we, would, we were anticipating growing out of our site in the next two years before we had the rail site. So, so we went from having, you know, I had 10 square feet in my backyard to, uh, you know, 15,000 square feet of warehouse, completely filled with tanks and oil and machinery and equipment. Um, and we were actually approaching the mass there, and lucky, lucky we got the grant. Isn't that spur long enough, 200 feet, so you can like three cars in the store? So 
so we can store three cars. It's going to be exactly 200 feet, um, and that is, is good for our, our normal day-to-day -day operation. But just adjacent to that, there's a few thousand feet of unused track that the rail company has agreed to let us use. So, a thousand feet, that's a lot of cars, um, and that, that's that modular storage we spoke of. So, you, you call that map of all those restaurants, you call those your clients, but I think it was your suppliers, correct? That you're actually supplying with, with one of the new terms itself. And so, you only use one buyer a year? Uh, we have several, but I mean, the majority of what we uh, ship does go here. We choose to stick with here because they're in the state. Other reasons. And all, they're all paying for you to take your oil away, or some are still paying for it? Yeah, I wish. <laughs> so, as I said before, we started out as uh, we paid, or they paid us a small amount of money. It went to a free service. And now it's a, uh, the, the, the suppliers or our clients recognize it as a commodity, and it is a commodity. So, we actually pay them every quarter. So, every time we pick up a gallon of oil, you know, we send them a check. How do you generate revenue? How do we generate revenue? Yeah, if you're if you're paying to pick up the oil, are you, are you selling it to the, uh, the company you deliver to? Yes, basically, yeah, we 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 we, we pay a a percentage of what we would make to the client or to the restaurant, and we you know process that oil and it goes to a bottles of refinery where we sell it for more money than. Cost us to collect it and, and uh, pay the customer. And that's and that's something uh, that it's a you know it's a market driven commodity. And right now it's extremely low. And it's twenty cents a gallon or twenty cents a pound versus you know two thousand eight where it's forty five cents a pound. So you know when we're when we're calculating where that revenue is going to be coming from, we're trying to figure out you know what kind of margin we have to play with. We're always watching the market too. And, uh, very early on, we decided to invest everything that we were making back into the business, and back into efficiency and things that were going to make the business tighter. Um, and as a result of that, that upfront you know, expenditure, when we do have a market that's half of what it's normally, um, we're still able to stay in business. Um, you know, 2008 is a great year because you have this big, big wide margin. And you take that money and reinvest it in the business so that when that market crashes, you're, you're lean and you're able to survive. A lot of other businesses didn't survive because, you know, they weren't thinking that way in the long term. Yeah? Did I hear you say oh, that just, sorry. oh, oh okay, that all of this started as a hobby, like it's just something you were interested in. So I'm very interested in hobby-based businesses that turn out like yours. Mm -hmm. At what point did you realize, hey, I have something Is, you know, I think pretty early on, it was, you know, when people started calling us, like when we were soliciting people, but like when people started calling us saying, hey, I hear you're doing something cool in a restaurant. I was like, oh, okay. So I think, I think just, um, you know, the, the financial still didn't particularly make sense at that point, <laughs> but people wanted us, wanted our service. Because really, the business was, like Jim said, it was a bunch of renderers who've been in business for 150 years. They, you know, talk to each other and play nice with each other. So, you know, the, the stage was pretty much set um, that the restaurant was going to get, uh, you know, screwed as best as possible. And uh, that was the situation, you know, when, oh, I'm not going to pick up your cooking oil until you pay me the $150. Or, or, you know, I'll be there Friday and they come on, you know, the following Wednesday. Um, really, because the restaurant owner had nowhere else to turn to at that point. 
stress and a lot of sleep loss. But you know, and it wasn't uh, for uh, several years until we started showing profit, really taking the salary. Pretty big commitment up front. You had a question? Yeah, I was curious about um, talking about how the market influences how you set your fees and your revenues. And so you went from collecting um, a fee for these organizations, your suppliers, to now you paying them. Is that how?
sulfur, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and there other other pollutants. Um, that the vegetable oil-based fuels that we deal in, they have much less of those pollutants. Um, we produce the same burning the yellow of our fuel produces the same amount of carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, um, but it's a carbon neutral cycle. So you grow a plant, you make some oil, you burn the oil, it makes carbon dioxide, and then the plant needs the carbon dioxide to make the oil. So it's it's a closed loop. So you're not uh, adding adding any more carbon uh, dioxide to the to the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, uh, diesel the diesel's a lot dirtier. Um, diesel doesn't have as much lubricity as it used to have. Um, we used to put sulfur in diesel to, to make it uh, it's lubricate the inter internals on the diesel engine. They've been taking that sulfur out because it um, causes asthma, and so you know, it's a pollutant. And as they take that diesel, uh, as they take that sulfur out of the diesel, ultra low sulfur diesel, um, you're seeing um, less longevity in diesel engines. Our fuel has all those lubricity properties, so it's cleaner to burn. Just inherently, and it has a lot more lubricity than, than even uh, high sulfur diesel fuel. So by using biofuel, you're actually increasing the longevity of your diesel platform. You're putting some of that lubricity back into the, the system. So is it cheap on buses? Uh, how cheap is it? Oh, how? Right now it's more, it's actually more expensive than, if you're going to buy a gallon of biodiesel, it's slightly more expensive than a gallon of petroleum diesel. But not always. No, no, it's, it's, it, but it's always close. It's right, right there. And a lot of that has to do with, um, I mean, a lot of that has to do with uh, a, a marketplace that's still, well, diesel still becoming something that stands on its own feet that isn't beholden to what the EPA standards are. You know, it's still very much affected by what the government regulations are, and that sometimes plays with that price a little bit. Do you have any plans to diversify since you go to all these restaurants to maybe start finding the recyclables that will work there? We actually have a plan to diversify the finished product and not necessarily sell it for biofuel and sell it for energy generation, or actually not sell it for, but use it for energy generation on our property. So we install how many megawatts? Six, six megawatts of generators on our facility, in our facility and run straight cooking oil, not biodiesel, in those um, generators and sell that back to Dinko. But it is a, a, it's a good point, you know, with 3,500 restaurants not in your Rolodex, you know, what, what else could you sell them? You know, uh, we've talked about grease traps, we've talked about it clean, we've talked about recycling, we've talked about compost, we've talked about a bunch of different things. Um, and anytime we come up with, you know, anytime we, 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 we think about that, it's just a whole other business. Um, and one of the things that, that we learned very early on, came to the conclusion together, we wanted to, we wanted to collect oil and for cars, and biodiesel, and have energy, and do, do all these different things. At some point we decided, hey, we're just gonna be really good at collecting oil. And the other stuff we'll figure out later. Right now, we're just gonna get good at collecting oil. And then we were like, okay, we're good at collecting oil, let's, let's process it so we can get more margin out of it. And that's pretty much where that stopped. We're, like, we're gonna be collectors, we're gonna be processors. All other stuff is really complicated. Um, and uh, really tried to stay focused on that, but, but it is a good point. I have this great client based from. Yeah, how, uh, how are you doing on talking oil this year compared to the year ago? You want to bring up that We've grown steadily every year, 25% um, roughly this year over last, and, and that's a pretty consistent growth curve over the past uh, several years. You know, the first few years of business, you know, it's 400% growth, 600% growth. Uh, but, but pretty steadily, year over year, we're growing 25%. Uh, Brendan's bringing up, uh, this is Greaser, this is a software platform or a web-based data management uh, platform that um, we developed in-house to help track and schedule. Um, we were keeping everything on an Excel spreadsheet. And everyone learned Excel. Excel is the most powerful thing in the world, yeah, I'm convinced. Um, but we were doing everything in Excel, and uh, Chris Master Polito saw how we were doing it. He was a, a software designer um, by, by hobby, not by trade. Um, saw what we were doing in Excel and uh, said he could do it way better and built us the initial platform so we could bring up all of our clients, all of the information about our business, all of the pertinent information about our business on our phone, on our, on our wireless device, on our computer. Um, and uh, 
know that's been a real boon for our growth. What's the growth? What nineteen percent from over last over last year? Nineteen percent. Four point six nine million gallons. Is that equate to nineteen percent more revenue? The, the employees ask us that a lot, actually. Yeah. <laughs> we empower all the employees that have very, a lot of access to this information because it's, it's a motivator. It's, there's some neat graphs at the bottom. You know, there's individual stats. So you get, you get this beneficial competition that's going on between drivers and between employees. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you do have employees come to you and they're like, well, I want a raise. It's like, well, it's, you know, you just you know, no. <laughs> Why do you think you get a raise? Because you guys are up 19%, so you must have a lot of money. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, for us, um, they, there's a lot of other increases that are taking place. So we're taking we're taking a lot more volume, but you know, fuel prices are going up. The rebates are, are you know, we we keep to be competitive. The market we spend a lot of money on the rebates to our customers. If fuel prices go up, mm -hmm. you pay more for the fuel. Don't you get more from the refinery? You, you would think so. And, uh, we sell based on the Jacobson index, which is a, a, a Fats and oil index that has been around forever. Yeah. Bringing transparency, transparency to an opaque market is oh, there. Right. Yeah. there it's not, it has nothing, no connection to the, the real world. Uh, not okay, but so the market's very much, very much driven by this index that isn't, isn't accurate. It's and it's really I just, it's market. Ninety percent of this, this market is really controlled by the largest renter in the uh, in, in the country. Is that passion or uh, dark? I mean, in my opinion, but you know, they have a lot of pull in the marketplace and can pretty much dictate the price. And, uh, there's, it, there's really no. Well, while I said there are these, these things that we do see, like a big harvest, you know, it's going to be a lot of virtual oil in the market. That, that we know that's going to have an effect. Um, but day to day, it's a, a point of great contention with us that you know the index doesn't necessarily represent what's going on out there in the real world, that makes it very hard for us to plan. And you'll, you'll see these strange, I remember a couple years ago, there was this massive dip in the market, and Brennan called the Jacobsons, whoa, what, what are you guys doing? What, what happened here? You want to get some commentary on it? And it was, the, the guy that did that in their organization was on vacation. And there's another guy that sat down for that week and was just kind of willy-nilly posting numbers. And the fact that so much rides on that, it's very hard to do. Having, having relationships with um, buyers like your OBX some, somewhat mitigates that in the sense that, you know, um, you, you can work out above market deals with them and they understand the true value of it. You know what their need is, so you can kind of play that a little bit. Back to data tracking, I mean, we can tell every new client that we brought on this year, you know, has brought us 163,000 gallons total. And the clients we lost, we lost 38,000 gallons. But our main attrition reason by far, is out of business. So nothing that we can really do anything about. And if we could, we have a lot of money. Two different laws of competition. One is a, uh, a broken contract, one is a non broken contract. There's, there's probably a very funny story in this one. <laughs>